Yesterday, I had the opportunity to testify at a House committee hearing to voice my support for legislation banning the castration and mutilation of children in Tennessee. Now, I've uh, addressed school boards in the past, as you know, but this was my first time in front of any kind of legislative committee, so it was an interesting learning experience, kind of like my own schoolhouse rock sort of uh, experience. And one of the key difference, differences here is that in my school board speeches, I've spoken out against policies and measures that the boards were wanting to put into place or, or, or had already put into place. In this case, however, I was speaking in favor of a bill that the majority of the legislature has already expressed support for. So I didn't need to convince them of what they already believe or urge them to do what they're already going to do, but rather my plan was simply to add my voice of support as a citizen of the state. Now, you may be understandably concerned based on that description that my appearance in front of this committee must have been rather boring and lacking the kind of fireworks that you might expect and hope for. Well, allow me to allay those fears, because fortunately for you, there were a, a few Democrats in the room who, though on the losing side of this issue, were still determined to use my appearance as an opportunity to try and score some points with their own base. So after I delivered my brief remarks and all the other witnesses, there were three others on the anti-mutilation side and four on the pro-mutilation side. They had, they had their turns also to, uh, to speak. And then the lawmakers on the committee had the chance to ask us questions. And the first question came from a Republican who had a very fair and relevant query about the oft-repeated claim, which we also heard from other witnesses uh, during the testimonies, that medically affirming, quote-unquote, trans-identified youth is necessary to decrease their suicide rate. And because this is the thing that got everything kicked off, I want to play this clip for you. It's a little bit long, but um, it's also, it's, uh, it's an important point, too. So here's my answer to his question. Just a quick question for you. We've heard in the news last week and even today that it's pro-life to vote against this bill. We've heard that um, suicides are prevalent and uh, suicide has impacted my family, so I'm sensitive when I hear something like that. I, I, I've, I've read some of the stuff that you've done, and I was wondering, can you speak to the statistics of, of uh, mental health and suicidal tendencies for the people who have gone through transition or for people who have not? In your studies, from what I've read, can you, can you speak to that? Mr. Sure. Sure. You're <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, the claim that uh, you know, doing the chemical castration drugs or surgery or hormonal intervention, the claim that this prevents suicide or uh, has uh, positive psychological effects down the line is utterly, totally baseless. Um, there are no credible long-term studies that bear that out. And one of the reasons for that is that there couldn't possibly be any credible long-term studies because we've never done this to kids on this scale ever before in history. So this current, uh, shall we say, crop of children, they are the guinea pigs. This is, this is all experimental. We're sort of trying it out on them to see if it works. Um, now, they have attempted a few times to do studies, and the interesting thing is that the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, WPATH, which is a radical far-left pro-trans organization, they commissioned a study to try to prove that, um, that hormones and puberty blockers uh, uh, decrease suicide rates among uh, trans uh, trans-identified youth, and even in their own study, they found that they couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't prove it. They couldn't make that link because it's just not possible to do. The other thing I would mention, too, is that, you know, the, the, the number of trans-identified youth has skyrocketed in recent years. We're talking about exponential 10x, 20x growth. Just huge numbers have, in, have, have, uh, have increased. And what we hear from the pro-trans side is that, uh, well, this is not a social contagion. It's just that, you know, there's always been this many trans people. It's just that they were not in an affirming uh, environment before in history, and so they couldn't come out. And now, for the first time, trans people uh, have, have the ability to live their truth, so to speak. Well, if that's the case, and there have always been these sort of like millions of trans people, and if it's also true that if we don't affirm them, that it would cause them to commit suicide, then we should be able to look back in history and find just this unbroken, incredible epidemic of children mysteriously killing themselves because they weren't being affirmed as trans. And what you find is that that didn't exist. I mean, the, the, the youth suicide rate has increased exponentially alongside trans affirmation. So trans affirmation causes the suicide rate, not the other way around. The last thing I'll note is that um, 
The suicide rate among trans-identified people is, is sky high. It remains sky high. All the data shows this. It remains sky high even after surgery. And in fact, in the most reliable data that we have, it's uh, years after surgery when suicidality is the highest for trans-identified people. That's the reality. Now, so you see all that. I make a number of claims and arguments in that answer, just as I did in my initial remarks, that the Democrats on the panel had the opportunity to refute. If indeed I was wrong about anything I said and can be refuted, then they had the chance to do it, but, but, but they couldn't refute it. They had nothing to say, which, as we've learned about Democrats, will certainly not stop them from talking. So the next question, or what pretended to be a question, came from a greasy little hack named Caleb Hemmer, who rather than discuss the issue at hand, Instead, decided to try and smear me with that um, Media Matters hit piece from my time as a shock jock morning host 15 years ago. Um, what does that have to do with anything? What, what did he think he would accomplish with this? Well, we'll find out. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. I found it interesting. One of our uh, um, people uh, testified today that they uh, had their gender affirming surgery at 16. And I know uh, you in former comments mentioned uh, this uh, on your blog. At about 16, you're an adult who's mature and can make decisions. Uh, you're that at 16. I don't care what anybody says. Even going so far as to say, you know, 16 people, uh, when you're 16, you should be married and, uh, and could be pregnant or should be pregnant. Um, so I'm curious if 16 is uh, a, uh, an adult in your view, uh, why does this bill have uh, the uh, minor de defined as 18? Uh, Mr. Yeah, well, that's, recognized. Uh, yeah that's, that's a hit piece you took from Media Matters, uh, from something when I was a, a radio host uh, 13, 14 years ago, my early 20s. Uh, it's also not an accurate reflection of what I actually said. Um, I was talking about uh, the fact that people tended to marry young historically, and that's all that that was about. Um, how does that relate to, the, to this subject? Just curious of your definition of, of if you feel like people are adults at 16, should... Well, people uh, are adults this. at 18, uh, but actually your, your brain is not fully developed until you're 25. So we should be having a conversation about whether we should even be doing these surgeries to people at 18. But certainly before 18, it's, it's absurd. I mean, do you, do, you, do you think that a 16-year-old can meaningfully consent to having their body parts removed? Do, do you? No? We do not. Yeah, we ask the questions. It's not. It's, uh, okay. Representative Hammer, you're recognized. So <clears throat> that was one gloriously awkward silence, uh, even more so for those of us in the room. Actually, you can't see it from that camera angle in the clip exactly, but Caleb sat back away from the microphone when I asked him that question, and he kind of looked off to the side, almost like he was trying to pretend he didn't hear the question. It was, it was, a, it was a bizarre scene, but not so bizarre when you consider that I had asked a question that Caleb Hemmer simply could not answer. He obviously couldn't say no, that 16-year-olds can't consent to having body parts removed, because then he'd be agreeing with me and with the legislation. He doesn't want to do that. But he also didn't want to come out and say yes, that 16-year-olds can consent, because that sounds horrific and insane when said out loud, and it puts him in the position of having to explicitly defend a totally indefensible proposition. You'll notice that leftists they often find themselves in this kind of situation. They, they, they hold many views that they cannot say out loud. Their actual positions on the issues are often so deranged, so inconceivably gross, so morally vacuous and incoherent that you can defeat them in an argument simply by asking them to clearly state their own premise. Of course, what this means is that leftists like, uh, uh, you know, leftists themselves, leftists like Caleb Hemmer, they themselves realize how evil their own policies are. They are deliberately pushing things that they recognize as unspeakably wicked, which is why they will not speak it out loud. And this puts people like Caleb Hammer somewhere, somewhere below mere partisan hacks. You've got partisan hacks, and then it's below them that you have the Caleb Hammers of the world. Because these are people who are consciously evil, which also explains why they would resort to smear tactics against a private citizen at a legislative hearing. Keep in mind, by the way, that I was not there as an author of the bill, uh, nor was I testifying as some sort of accredited expert. I, I didn't stand up there and say, I'm a medical expert and a doctor, and this is what... 
I, I, in fact, I introduced myself as uh, I'm a citizen of Tennessee, I'm a husband and a father, and this is how I feel about this. Um, a citizen of Tennessee who supports the bill. And this is supposed to be a democracy, they tell me, right? So the point is that even if they could succeed in tearing me down and embarrassing me, which sadly for them, they didn't, how would that remotely come close to proving that the legislation is bad? Now, if you're wondering how Caleb Hemmer will recover from this humiliation, well, he'll do it or he'll try to do it the most weaselly and dishonest way possible, of course. So shortly after the hearing, Ben Shapiro posted that full exchange that you just watched, and he posted, he posted it to Twitter. Uh, Hemmer responded to the post with a link to a different video, which he urged people to watch instead to see what, quote, really went down. Now, that video was an edited montage by an obscure left-wing propaganda rag called the Tennessee Holler. And what they did is they took all the questions that the, uh, and not really questions, but statements that Dem the Dem Democrats on the committee hearing made to me, and they spliced all that together and then cut out most of my responses. And then anything else that may have been especially embarrassing for the Democrats and pasted all the rest of it together with a bunch of very obvious jump cuts and posted that. So Hemmer, therefore, is actually claiming that an edited montage without my responses is a more accurate reflection of what actually transpired than the full unedited clip. That's how shameless this guy is. By the way, if you're concerned about his lack of honesty um, and this lack of honesty from an elected official, or perhaps you're not satisfied with his refusal to answer my simple question, you could always reach out to him on uh, any of his social media channels. And look, I'm not telling you, I want to be very clear about this. I am not telling you that I want you all to spam his Twitter and his Facebook and Instagram, that I want hundreds of the, you know comments and everything attacking him. I, I'm not. I, I could not tell you to do that. I couldn't tell you to do that. I just want to make sure that you have his information so that uh, you can reach out to him to express your concerns. Again, he's, a, he's an elected official. So you can find him on Twitter at Caleb Hemmer. That's C-A-L-E-B-H-E-M-M-E-R. Or Instagram the same way. Then you go to Facebook. Uh, you go Facebook.com slash Caleb Hemmer TN. And then Caleb Hemmer.com slash contact will take you to his website. And that's the contact information for his office. So again, if you have any concerns about the behavior of this public official, um, or if you really want to know, like, does he think that 16-year-olds can consent to having body parts removed, he still hasn't answered that question. But I, I bet he'd, he'd love an opportunity to answer it. And I, and I think he's, he, he, would, he would want to hear from you. He'd be very glad to hear from you. So you can always do that if you want. Now, there's more, though. The next question came from uh, Democrat John Ray Clemens, who also had no interest in talking about the substance of the issue. Instead, with the slander already covered by Caleb Hemmer, Clemens went to the Democrats' second favorite tool in the box, which is credentialism. Let's watch. Can you give us a summary of your educational background or your health care education experience? M Mr. Walsh, you recognized. My experience in health care? Your educational background. I'm just curious. You, 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 you've yeah. testified as to a lot of your own research, so I'm curious for what purpose you do that and what background you have to qualify you to speak to that. Well, my background that qualifies me to speak to this is that I'm a human being with a brain and common sense, and I have a soul. And so, therefore, I think it's a really bad idea to chemically castrate children. That is my experience. Um, also, I, I did, now it's true, I didn't, I didn't go to college, but I did go to school long enough to learn how to read so I can read the data for myself, and that's exactly what I've done. Uh, Representative Clemens, here I And for what purpose do you um, conduct your research and use this brain of yours? Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. I use it for the purpose of trying to protect children from being castrated and mutilated. That's one of the things I try to do. You don't use it limits. to... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You don't use it to get clicks on your Let's state publication? It. Well, are you using it right now to try to get clicks with this interaction? On, no. I, 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 I really like the Mr. idea Walsh. of getting... Uh, of, of drawing attention to the fact that this is happening to children. I know you seem to find it very amusing. I don't. Yes, what qualifies me to speak up against chopping body parts off of kids? Which credentials give me the right to form an opinion about the sterilization of middle schoolers? I wonder what John Ray Clements might have said if I told him that um, I'm also against drowning bags of puppies in the river. I'm not even a big dog guy, but like, I don't think that you should put puppies in a bag and drown them in the river. If I were to tell him that, would he have demanded to know what veterinarian school I attended? 
This apparently comes as a shock to Mr. Clemens, but using your brain and your conscience, it's not the kind of job that requires a resume or professional references. That's something you're supposed to be doing all the time, especially when it comes to this particular issue. But this is all they have. They cannot challenge me on the merits. They cannot debate me on the substance of the issue. They cannot explain why I'm wrong. So instead, they will make the case that whether I'm wrong or right, I shouldn't be saying anything at all. That is real. That's the entire argument. <laughs> that is the only argument I have heard from these people uh, since, since I started talking about this, this issue years ago. The only argument they have, it really only boils down to, you shouldn't be talking about this. Yet they can't even make that case convincingly, so instead they're left with the bumbling, ridiculous mess you just witnessed. Now, there were more questions, or questions, I should say. Um, after the exchange we you just saw there, another Democrat representative started reading my tweets where I advocate for capital punishment for drug traffickers. Now, what in the world could that possibly have to do with the bill in question? Well, he couldn't explain that. And I didn't have a chance to point out how irrelevant it was because they wouldn't let me respond either. So after that happened, they basically got tired of me answering. And so for most of the rest of the time, it was just them talking to me. And then uh, if I tried to speak, they bang the gavel. No, this is not, this is not, it's not time for responding. It's democracy in action, folks. Isn't it inspiring? But this is all predictable, of course. Um, I don't want you to think that I was surprised or caught off guard. That was their intention. But unfortunately, they were using the same tactics on me that a million hacks and charlatans before them have already used. What I'll say to the Democrats on the committee is this. If you want to rattle me with smears and irrelevant, out-of-context quotes and bad faith questions and accusations, etc., you're going to have to try a lot harder than that. A lot harder. Or instead... Instead of trying to get better at being gutless smear merchants and disgraceful hacks, you could instead work on becoming better people, better men. You could stop trying to defend the indefensible, what you, you, what you yourself know to be indefensible. You could stop trading in your soul for the sake of promoting and defending the most depraved ideological agenda mankind has ever known. And instead, you could try to be men of dignity and integrity and moral courage. That's the other option. It's an option that will work out a lot better for you in a lot of ways, including come judgment day, I would add. And in the meantime, another bonus, maybe you won't make such asses of yourself in any more committee hearings. Just a thought. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you on Friday. Godspeed.